Hey everybody, this is Michael Estes. It's time to claim your seat, embrace the narrative that defines triumph. This is a Seat at the Table podcast where dreams are kindled and destinies are crafted. Welcome aboard. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of a Seat at the Table podcast. I have my special guest this week. It's Dennis McCarter of McCarter Wine Cellar. And um, this is going to be a special segment because it's it's kind of off the beating path of what we normally do. But I want to introduce Dennis McCarter to you. Say hello, Dennis. Hi, everybody. So, so Dennis, uh, starting off, um, you know, with the questions, um, you know, what inspired you? Can you can you can you share a moment during culinary school? Because I remember you told me you were in culinary school and that's when you had this epiphany. Right. That sparked a passion for winemaking. How did that food and wine pairing class influence your journey? Well, I was over at the Center of the Junior College many years ago and I found out how the food elevates the wine. The wine elevates right, the food. Right. But then there's this um, in that class, you also learn about sensory. Of, okay. um, of of cooking and uh, of, of pairing things. And so utilizing the five senses of taste, which is um, sweet, salty, savory, um, bitter, umami. Okay. And when you understand those components, you can create ambrosia from anything. And so from taking that class, it sparked my interest in wine. I just didn't know how to find it and how to go about it. And so I started eventually doing wine tasting uh, across Summit County and across California, and my journey began. Wow, that's amazing, because my interest that even brought me here to even meet you is is I had an interest in African-American winemakers mm. and brands, and um, just, just really not been familiar with the many African-American winemakers and brands to actually have one come on the set and 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 give their story that that's an awesome thing so um <clears throat> you you mentioned visiting many wineries and learning from winemakers can you talk about one significant lesson or place of advice a, a pl- piece of advice excuse me that shaped your approach to winemaking there's so many but um well, you know a what? Take that, your time, and, yeah. and 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 if you want to do more than one, then then you know just the ones that hit you okay. really good. Well, one that comes to mind is um, winemaker John Billens. Uh, at the time, uh, he was the winemaker for uh, Meadowcroft. Okay, and he gave a uh, he gave me a sample of Muscat Canelli, and it was so aromatic. It was dry, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is so good!" And he's like, "Well, you want to make a good aromatic white? You got a cool ferment." Um, anywhere between 50 and 45 degrees. I was wow. like, okay, so he keeps the fruity phenolics and everything. I was like, I like that. I'm gonna so, the, so there's a big science to it then, huh? Yeah, there's a science to it okay. and, 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 and methods that, that work, yes. Okay, no, keep keep going. And so so the so I tried I tried doing that when I started making my white whites. I did a Viognier and uh, did the same thing, except on a smaller scale, five gallons, and had it in a, a submerged tub with ice cubes that I had to keep, you know, in frozen ice bags and keep cycling through just to make the wine. Mm-hmm. And uh, it cool fermented for about a month. And eventually, uh, you know, once it was done, we racked it, cleared it out, and bottled it, it got a, a solid gold. And that was my first oh, white wow. award-winning wine. Wow. So, so, so I was going to ask the question, what was it like? To make your first batch of wine, but you you just told me on your first batch of wine you 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 won an award. Well, yeah, well, the, my first white wine, yes, my okay. first, first first white wine. Okay, was, my my first batch was was Barbera. Okay, and, uh, and that I didn't have all the equipment and didn't have all the things to, to do it right, so I wasn't prepared. But I I wanted the grapes and I got some lugs of uh, three lugs of, of grapes, almost a little bit of hundred pounds, uh, hand distemmed and did, did it the hard way. Uh, then hand stirred while it was fermenting, mm-hmm. then put it in the carboys and kept tasting like, oh, my gosh, this tastes delicious. It tastes great. And I made it. I'm so proud. <laughs> and then I was like, let me add some oak chips. OK. And then did, oaked it. And, but I didn't really have a timeline of when I need right. the bottle. I didn't have a right. schedule. And so when I bottled it, um, it was probably in still early. It was still in March. And by the time spring picked up. It was fizzing in the bottle, oh, and wow. so I had to learn from that mistake. But learn the importance of doing lab analysis, uh, also understanding 
that you have to do malolactic fermentation on your reds or find a way to inhibit that. Oh, yeah. so so there's there's a structure and a way to do it so that you doesn't so that you won't um, make mistakes and the wine will be right. Good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Always try to do it right the first time. Okay. Okay. So so how long how long how long joining um how long joining the winemaking groups like Genco and participating in events at the beverage people impact your growth and knowledge as a winemaker? Well, the beverage people was a, is a great wine shop. I would go to it many times for resources and asking the staff. And so from that, um, they're like, okay, you know, you're here a lot. You should come to these mixers. So I'll show up to the mixers. So it was like a networking group. It was like a networking group. It okay. was a store with, with like a like a monthly networking group where mm -hmm. you just go out and people, you know, some people make cheese, make beer, make wine, and all share their craft. So, so a bunch of creatives. Yes. Cool. And so it was really nice to eat, sip, and and this network and then find out, oh, someone's a great grower. Um, they You can get Zippendel from these folks. Like, oh, that is great. And then someone want to know about scented maceration or cold soaking mm -hmm. um, and, you know, have great conversations and what methods to do. So it was really helpful. And then with Genco, it, it was another step because it was predominantly home winemakers wine, wine and um, many that have great experience, many years experience. And so it was really cool to pick their brains. And, wow. and, and, you know, find out different methods and also same thing, find out sources for, for, for grapes. Well, this is interesting, man. I mean, this is like, I'm amazed. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really amazed. Um, so, so you, you work with a, with a wide range of grape veritals. I hope I'm saying that right. right. Yeah, it's all good. Um, do you have a favorite verital to work with and why? Well, you know, if you ask me what my favorite wine is, I'm going to say yes to all. But um, I love, right now, I'm loving Zen and Pinot. Um, okay. And I mean, because it's a little bit warmer. Zen is, this has that nice peppery, um, jammy, um, brambly uh, notes, usually blackberry. Um, very well structured if it's done right. And I could have it with barbecue, burger. I could drink that every day. Pinot Noir. It's going to be on the other side of that, that spectrum, a little bit more softer. Uh -huh. um, it's it's your classy lady. It's um, almost, especially with mine, you, you get those notes of pomegranate notes and um, orange rind and uh, not overly oaked. Uh, so just, just the right amount of spice. Well, cool, cool. I'm going to back up a little bit because um, I, I'm, I'm looking here and I remember having a conversation with you and just just talking, we were just chatting, and you told me you started out in insurance, and that kind of led to where you are now today, right? Yeah. yeah so, so talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I started out doing insurance, um, growing my ag agency um, back in 08, okay. and um, and did everything from, you know, cold calling to writing my policies and uh, eventually having overhead to worry about, and so it, it was a struggle, um, and especially after the tubs and nuns fires, it changed how my, how, how to function in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I couldn't write a lot of home and people were beginning to leave the state. And in between that, I was also a hobbyist winemaker. Wow. And so, um, so I'll make it. So that little... setback kind of caused you to go into the wine industry I mean, to really focus even more, right? Yeah, because I was like, you know what? I'm not doing very good at this. I need to exit. I was like, what am I passionate about? You know, and and so far, I knew the answer was wine. Wow. So. You know, I always say a setback is nothing but a setup for a comeback. There so, so, so look at you now. And I mean, I'm just tripping because I'm looking at, you know, you know I've, although I'm not a wine drinker myself, but I see your label and your brands in stores. I see them in wine shops and things like that. And I, I just think that that's amazing, you know. And then at the same time, being an African-American winemaker, you know, for me to even have an interest with my Tasting Room Travels um, group page on Facebook, I mean, wow, that's, I mean, it's it's just amazing to me. And, and, and I really thank you for taking the time to come out um, and sit down with me on the Seat at the Table podcast. But we're going to move on. Um, 
you know, how did the pandemic of 2020 and the fires, because because that was the same time they had the pandemic, they had the fires in 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 Napa in 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 wine in country Sonoma. Yeah, Sonoma, in Sonoma, yeah. yeah. So yeah. and you're in Sonoma, right? That's where your grapes yeah. are. Yeah, things I'm, like I'm born, that. Yeah, I was born and raised in Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, uh-huh. and uh, so I have a. I feel like I have a history in the in the land, seeing it from growing up in the boondocks to seeing it how it's, how it developed today. So you grew up around grapes. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would say. I grew up seeing the boom of the wine industry a little right. bit, where you know you see empty fields. Years later, you, you see they, they fi- become grapes, right? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. You see fields of vineyards. Wow. So yeah, it, it, and so um, I remember going to elementary school and going to the Harvest Fair, which is at the Summit County Fair, and uh, where it was a um, it was an event that encourages youth to get involved in agriculture. And so they would have, you know, farm competitions right. and you see 4-H uh, where, you know, they're milking sheep and, and whatnot. And um, so I always had a somewhat of an interest in part, a part of agriculture and in food production. Okay. And okay. so that does tie into to wine. Maybe. So so how did, how did the, let's talk about the fires during, during that time yeah. and the pandemic. How did that impact on your business? Well, so... Oh, you mean back to the insurance? No, no, on, okay. on as far as wine, wine. Okay. On the wine side. So, so while I was still a seller worker, especially in 2020, um, you know, we're already navigating the pandemic, social distancing, working one week on, one week off to try to offset the exposure to uh, other workers. Mm-hmm. And so then harvest comes up and what seems to be fine because grapes are coming in and we're processing. And then we get... The first fire, which I can't remember, one one was the lightning fire, and one was the glass fire. Right. Whatever this when when, this, when the first one came, we were like all worried, as you know, production folks and winemakers, different wineries, we were sweating like, okay, please not be a major one. <laughs> right. Then the second one hits, it killed the season, and um, the facility I worked at did about forty percent of the production it normally does. Uh, which is a lot less. And right. so That's following into 2021, um, there was very little, little wine work. So uh, people got let go. I was one of them. And, um, and yeah, so that's how it affected me is it was a, a job, job loss temporarily. Yeah. But, but also it became a, a springboard to you starting your own wine business. Yes. Is, is, is that, is that how that worked? Yeah. So that, that was almost how it worked. Cause I did try to find other opportunities in the wine industry that year and then it just wasn't wasn't happening because of course we're coming out of pandemic or still in the middle of it that is mm-hmm. and um i was like you know maybe next year um you know we should start something uh me and my wife and you know she said well i'll think about it i'll ponder it and, and friends are already saying we want in we want to see you do it we would love your wine and and so um so you were encouraged by a lot of friends family and yes. and, and people that are close in your circle yeah, right big circle support, that kind of yes. like pushing you out there like go do it dennis go do it pretty dennis much, right? pretty much because you know because i always had the voice back in my head saying your brother there's not too many of us out there right doing this and um you know less than one percent is african-american owned or even has african-american winemaker and I'm not saying there's a barrier, but it is hard to get in. Oh, it's and, like um, anything else. Yeah. You know, it's it's like anything else when you're uh, initially starting or coming into, you know, a profession and it's not a lot of people that look like you, then it's a barrier. It, yeah. it definitely is a barrier. Not not saying that it's a negative barrier, but it definitely is a barrier, mm-hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about, you know, your achievements and accolades, because, you know, I, I, if I'm right, you've only been a winemaker for for less than three years, right? Well, yeah, for about less than three years, about, you know, the so car sales was started in 2022. I did work in production for other people um, a few years prior. But yeah, so it's uh, still a baby. And uh, so our first vintage was in 2022. Yeah. And... This is the bragging part, y'all. So, but, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about and I, and he's very Dennis is very humble. I just want you to know that. But, I'll bring it out then. I'll yeah, bring it out, come on, guys. come on with it. Come on with so, it. So, uh, but prior to stepping into the commercial side full time for Macar Sellers, I had to end the career for my amateur uh, times for Macar Sellers. So my last pinot that I've made um, was uh, twenty nineteen. 
uh, Russian River Valley Pino, and um, it, that took best of class at the Harvest Fair, which meant the world to me because I've been competing. But what does that mean? What What does best it's, of class mean? It, it, it means that's the it's the pinnacle of a good what a good Pinot is or okay. what a good wine is. And um, so that's and like so, the gold medal. Yes. It, okay. It's the best of the best. Pretty okay. Much. And um, yes, gold medal and, yeah. and all that. And so, and so to get that, it, it meant a lot to leave, you know, to, to leave the amateur category. Cause I've met a lot of colleagues along the way right. and, and they're like, right on, that's the best way to finish. And, and so I was like, well, now on to this professionally. And, you know, and so um, end up making my Pinot Noir uh, from Forchini Vineyards, uh, which is, sorry, Forchini Vineyards, which is right out um, in Hillsburg, Rush River Valley, right next to Acorn, across street from Aperture. Uh, anyone that's familiar with the area, they've been on one-on-one going from Windsor to Hillsburg and you see the white barn, mm-hmm. uh, white house. Uh, that's where I got, got those grapes from. It was a martini clone and not to go too far into specs of production and what I did with it, um, it tasted great when it was done and when it was bottled, um, it ended up winning uh, double gold at San Francisco Chronicle. And, um, then a few months later, um, best of class at the North coast wine challenge was put on by the press Democrats. Wow. And so that's, um, featuring wineries, um, that's in Marin, Sonoma, Napa, Solano, Marin, that's why I said Marin, Mendocino, and um in lake county and so out of 2000 wineries i showed pretty well it was number one. Oh yes okay well okay. Not, not quite well it was number one in that category but not not the best of the best but definitely the best of class okay so let, let, let's talk about um sourcing your grapes okay. you know let, let's just touch touch on that because i know people think that just winemaking is is really really easy or maybe even think that it's hard work but it starts with the grapes right and and when i say sourcing your grapes explain that to the audience well sourcing means i i purchase grapes from the grape grower right and um so i find a relationship with a vineyard owner and say hey you willing to work with me good here's what i want here's what i'm looking for and um i've been lucky enough to work with uh Fracini, Boletto, and a few others. And, um, and so with that, um, I tell them what specs I would like to see mm-hmm. the, the grapes at before picking and visit frequently. Oh, and, wow. um, and so, uh, what I love about Sonoma County is, um, 90% of the vineyards are sustainable. Mm. And what that means is, um, they use less water. Um, they use, um, uh, owl boxes, bat boxes for pest management right and uh they do cover crops sometimes use sheep to do some of the trimming of mm-hmm. of the wild growth of weeds and whatnot and so just treating the land better not taking too much from it mm-hmm. not taking too much water uh, which helps make for better quality wine right uh, as um as opposed to over watering and over fertilizing and so um for good quality grapes good quality wine and it and it shows. That's why I'm a big believer in Summit County as I'm born in it. And right, right. It's, I want it's, to home. From it. it's, yes. it's home. It's home. You know, I remember talking to you um, when I came to Santa Rosa to the wine festival and you were telling me about a story where you were giving, someone gave you some grapes and it was like a whole lot of grapes. Right. Oh, talk to me yes. about that story. <laughs> you know that that's share that with the audience because we'll I I just you know how how sometimes you know an overabundance is what pushes you forward. Well, um, I'm gonna give a shout out to Monty Henson then uh, on this story. Uh, so back in I think '94, no, not '94. Sorry, back in 2014, I ended up meeting Monty Henson uh, at a event known as Play and Pour. Uh, it's at Fountain Grove. Who, who, I mean, Club. the name, but who, who, what is his title? Who is he? Well, he owns the vineyard. Okay. Yeah, and um, and so I was was paired paired with him because he was an industry person. Right. I, I wasn't. I was this insurance guy that was doing a golf mm-hmm. event. And firstly, was interested by this event was every hole you played um, had a winery pouring for you. So you had to be pretty careful. Otherwise, it get pretty <laughs> sloshed. By the end of the, oh, yeah. end, end of the day, right? Oh, yeah. But me and him had a great time meeting and uh, met his wife and his wife and met my wife. And um, 
you know, smoke cigars and this had a, had an exchange of information. I said, Hey, he said, what did you do? I was like, well, I do insurance, make a little wine at home. He's like, well, I have grapes. I'm like, really? He said, you want some grapes? I'm like, yeah. And so I was thinking a couple hundred pounds and it was Zinfandel, by the way, it was Zinfandel that was growing off of Lenox Springs wow. road and um, the uh, vineyards known as Rancho Mar Maria. Mm -hmm. um, they also sourced their grapes to Mazaco and make their own wine too uh, for themselves known wow. as Rancho Maria. So it's a, it's a really good, um, it's a really good, good clone. I'm going to stop right there real fast. Did I say martini clone? I'm not sure. You can redo that scene. Okay. You can start from the beginning. Okay. I'll start from, I'll start from, or go in. Well, it, yeah. So, so his vineyard is uh, Rancho Maria. Okay. And he grows Zinfandel and a little bit of Petit Syrah. The Zinfandel is actually a maple clone, and um, about was at the time was about twenty five years established already, and sells to Mazaco, makes a little wine for themselves right. for their own label known as Rancho Maria. So anyhow, we get you know year the year goes by and gets close to the next season, and we keep in touch here and there, and he's like, hey, about that half ton. I was like, <laughs> oh, I thought this was gonna be a couple hundred. No, no, it's like. Yeah, I, was, I, I I do myself in carboys. I don't do myself in barrels. Like bar carboys, no, you gotta do the, do the real deal. So he gave me uh, his um, his macro bin, which is a big old white bin that holds mm -hmm. all all the fruit. Right, right. And uh, me and me and my wife Laura ended up harvesting second crop, which was the case. It was second crop then, all over his property. We started early in the morning. We got out by the late afternoon. So it's hard work. It was hard work, and Laura doesn't ever want to do that again. And I'm sorry, <laughs> sweetie. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I ended up making some really good fruit out of that. So that was the uh, 2015 Zinfandel, um, and it had a little bit of the Petit Syrah that grew on his property, right. too. I would say a ratio-wise, had to be been almost maybe 10%, so it helped with the color. And when it was done, it was lush, uh, good cherries, nice brambly fruit. Um, I did it in neutral oak and add a little bit of oak, oak cubes. Right. And, um, eventually I bottled it and then that became one of my first gold medals in. Wow. I mean, this and, is uh, amazing, man. I'm just, oh, yeah. I just, I'm just really blown away. Just, just hearing your story. You know, I, I'm really glad that, um, you know, we're taking the time out to, to showcase something a little different than, than what I normally do. But at the same time, it's not different. You know, it's, it's not different because, you know, you're talking about an entrepreneurial journey, but an entrepreneurial journey into winemaking, you know. Yeah. So um, looking ahead, um, what, are, what are your goals for your winery? Are there any new projects or Veritels you're excited to explore in the future? Well, next month, I'm going to be following my 2023 Pinot Noir. Okay. And uh, this is done from a source from a different vineyard. And um, Bear Vineyard, to be exact. Um, the owner of that vineyard, his name's Larry Bear of the San Francisco Giants. I haven't okay. met him. I haven't got tickets from him. Wow. But um, but when I when I heard Bear, I was like, by any chance, that wouldn't be Larry Bear. And the vineyard manager was like, yeah, actually, it is. I'm like, holy mobily. So secondary property, most right, likely. Right, right. But uh, the vineyard's absolutely beautiful. It's off of West Side Road. Um, and almost what, when you're leaving Hillsburg, heading towards the Forestville, so quite hilly, definitely gets a lot of the river, Russian River influence, okay. fog okay. and whatnot. And so um, I did, that was done in about 50, it was 50% Pomard clone and then 67, sorry, 667. So 50%, 667 clone. And um, did the same recipe I did for my other Pinot and, um, so it's just tasting beautiful right now. Wow. It, it's tasting even better than the 22. Um, I'm going to be sourcing from them again this year. And um, then I have some Zinfandel coming up. Uh, so the Zen is going to be from Rock Powell, ABA, which is a American cultural area mm -hmm. that's just north of Dry Creek Valley. Uh, I would say it's Dry Creek Valley on steroids because you're dealing with high elevation grapes. Um, when you when grapes are grown in elevation past 1,000, the sun is about 10% stronger, which makes the grapes grow thicker skins. Mm -hmm. And the essence of the grape, um, or the essence of the wine, comes from the grape. So um, you get more tannins, you get more color, uh, more phenolic flavors. 
And so anytime I tasted a wine that was sourced from Rock Pile ABA, I'm usually blown away. Wow. And I'm excited to work with this. That's one cool. Only about that's, that's cool. less than a dozen sourced from that, that area. So let's talk about your foundation work. Um, you serve as a board member of Sonoma, Sonoma County Library Foundation. Let's talk about your roles and how, how did that happen? Well, that happened uh, because I did aqua aerobics and, um, and I knew a woman named Mary Graves who uh, was a descendant to John Brown who, who worked, worked with Mary Ellen Pleasant uh, to abolish slavery. Okay. And so uh, she was very proud and done very well to, to organize an event that was held at Belton Ranch that was uh, founded originally by Mary Ellen Pleasant. And, um, and so we're there in celebration during Black History Month. And I ended up finding um, other folks that were participating that were largely um, library foundation members mm -hmm. for Summit County. And so the meeting starts as a luncheon. And I'm like, I'm not sure what to expect. I'm thinking, oh, well, this is, should be cool. And I brought some of my bottles of wine um, that weren't quite, I didn't have my commercial wines just yet. Right, right. And, um, and so I hear them speak about wanting to build a library in Roseland and want to help the underserved areas, which I'm all about. Um, right, I understand. You know, I run a nonprofit judo program. Uh -huh. um, I want to give back any way I can. And and so when I heard that, I was like, this is a sign that I need to join, you know. I said, sign me up, because I'm a, ch I'm a child of Roseland. Um, I remember having to go across town to another, another side of the city just to have access to a library. Uh, no family deserves to, you know, go through that. And right. so... Uh, I want to, I want to help. I want to give back. And so um, that worked out. They recruited me. I joined. And so what I do is fundraising uh, to help build the library, but also there's a love for wine with the foundation too. And so, um, so we, we had an idea to do a few fundraising events, one of them being Tasting Diversity. And um, that is to celebrate Black excellence in the wine industry uh, of Sonoma County, but also to help encourage the next generation. Right, to educate, wanna, to wanna and things pursue. like that, to get people involved in understanding or know how to get involved if, in case they want to learn to make wine. Exactly, okay. exactly. And so um, what the first season diversity was held in, in February, and we had a great panel. Um, uh, we had um, quite a few other black, you know, black, black winemakers, uh, one of them being um, Rosalind, um, of uh, Fog Crest, who, okay. who hosted the event. Mm -hmm. Beautiful property, by the way, out there. And um, and then Dan Glover, not the actor, but everyone usually thinks that. Right. Um, he was an ex-music producer, but he uh, owns um, Lob, Lob, Lob J uh, Wines out in Hillsburg. And then Chris Christensen of Bakken, who made America's first sparkling um, Sauvignon Blanc. Wow. And, um, and then we also had um, Brene Royale, who used to work for EJ Gallo at the time and it, it was it, as a vineyard manager. Mm -hmm. And if you ask how many other black, you know, black vineyard managers do you know of, let alone be female. Mm -hmm. And so she rocked it. She moved on to better, to another better position, but she rocked it. And it was an honor to meet her. So this, the, 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 the group of people there was pretty much the cream of the crop in yeah. the African-American wine industry, winemaking industry, right? Oh yeah. And uh, wow. it was a great, great panel. And then we had um, Jay Jackson who played um, Purdy on uh, Parks Recreation and mm -hmm. playing, playing quite a few other films as well. Uh, he's also a level three um, W set, uh, sir, that is, he has. And so he did a great job with the interview of the panel. And wow. um, I want to stay in the back background because I organized it. So, <laughs> but I, yeah, I had a, the, the catering was, was black owned restaurants with black owned wines at a black owned winery. It, 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 it was a different concept that no one ever seen before. And we actually outsold the event. As well. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, because, and, you know, one of the things with tasting room travel is the restaurant pairing and the wine brand pairing coming together and presenting it in front of uh, African-American wine enthusiasts. So that's kind of what you did. You did something that I have a vision for <laughs> already, right? So oh, yeah. we need to get together for real. You oh, know, yeah. we, we, we definitely need to get together. Um, Dennis, is there anything else that you feel like you want to say to the audience um, that, that, that you feel 
I mean, maybe just just from the from your heart. Okay, well, if you have a passion for something, definitely pursue it. Don't let the um, don't don't hesitate on it. Don't right. um, sometimes you have to push beyond the the voice that says I can't. The doubt. Right? Yes. Um, the other is um, if you like to find my wines, you can find my wines at mccartersellers dot com. Offer wine club and um, and I'll keep making more award winning stuff. Um, I am small, so I, I didn't mention that. So I do about uh, two hundred fifty cases a year, and so I, I'm very boutique, but um, I make good wines. Well, you got some medals. That's all I know. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> some some of these some of these countries in the Olympics are small, but when they run and they get that gold, it's still a gold medal. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, oh, yes. so so if you want to look at that analogy right there, I mean, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out to travel, to come to to be here in the studio and talk about something that, you know, a lot of us really don't know a lot about, which oh, yeah. is African-American winemaking and the brands. You know, there's probably about and, and I don't take this as gospel. I've been doing some research and I count about close to 60 different brands of African-American wines. And, 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 and basically I talk to people all the time. And what's so funny is I don't even drink <laughs> at all, you know, and I remember you laughing at me about that in the beginning. I'm like, Dennis, but I don't drink, you know, but, but I, I'm still interested. Um, I'm still interested, but the, 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 the thing that I really want the to bring about the awareness is because I've actually stopped and asked people to name five African American brands of wine and they can't do it. So my goal is to disrupt that and to change that. And um, like I said, thank you so much for coming on, Dennis. I mean, it's it's um why I have a seat at the table podcast is because I get an opportunity to meet people like you, man. Well, thank you so much. And one more thing. Okay, go for it. Uh I gotta 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 give a a shout out to to my wife mm -hmm. as a, she she's the mother of the company. So I'm Got the it. father of it. And my son. Love you, man. All right. All right. So there you have it, guys. Um, this is Dennis McCarter of McCarter Sellers. And um, he decided that he wanted to take the time out and take a seat at the table. Pie. Wow. It's so good. Have a great day.